Hi, I'm Mackenzie from the Women's Direction and we really need to talk about the Golden Globes. Welcome, welcome one and all to our very first video blog. I'm super excited. This has been a long time coming and today we're finally kicking it off and I'm super excited. <laughs> I think I already said that. Anyways, a little bit about me before we get started. My name is Mackenzie, as I said, and back in 2017, I started a film blog called The Women's Direction, which aimed to bring awareness about the gender inequality present within the film industry. It has since grown into a video content creation business that's been running for about the last two and a half years. And today, it's now a YouTube channel. So yes, to kick things off for January 2023 and to kick off the channel, I thought that we would delve into the Golden Globes because I have some thoughts. So the Golden Globes took place last week uh, and I will admit I did not watch the ceremony. Um, there are a few reasons why I'm not really a big fan of award shows, which I will get into, but I digress. The real issue I want to delve into today is the serious lack of female nominees in the Best Directing category. So in case you missed it, the nominees for this year were Steven Spielberg for The Fablemans, James Cameron for Avatar The Way of Water, Baz Luhrmann for Elvis, Martin McDonough for The Banshees of Inner Sheeran, and Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert for Everything Everywhere All at Once. And Spielberg ended up taking out the win for Best Director and Best Picture. With an average age of about 54, these all-male nominees are directors who, with exception of the Daniels, have been beating around the fold-out linen chair bush for many years, their names echoing through film school halls and top 10 best insert thing here lists the world over. Now, I spoke to Lindsay Dooley from ABC Radio Illawarra back in December when the nominees were first announced, and he had a question for me, which was... Have there been any films directed by women this year? And yes, there definitely were films directed by women in 2022. In fact, there is an entire list on womeninhollywood.com to prove it. So I read an article recently on Den of Geek, which was a speculative article about which films may be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars this year. And that article included at least three films directed by women that could be potential contenders. They were The Woman King, directed by Gina Prince Blythewood, After Sun, directed by Charlotte Wells, Did you ever move back to Scotland? No. Why? and Women Talking, directed by Sarah Polly. Why does love, the absence of love, the end of love, the need for love, result in so much violence? Which did actually receive a screenplay nomination in the Golden Globes this year. Yet none of these women or their films appeared in the Golden Globes nominations list for Best Director. So it begs the question, what is different about 2023 when the past two years we have seen women nominated in the Best Director category? The Center for the Study of Women in Television and Films report The Celluloid Ceiling, Employment of Behind-the-Scenes Women on Top-Grossing U.S. Films in 2022, found women comprised of 24% of directors, producers, executive producers, writers, editors, and cinematographers working on the top 250 grossing films. This was a decline of one percentage point from 25% in 2021. And in the role of directors, women comprised 18%, which was also a decline of one percentage point from the year before. However, these numbers aren't a big enough decline to represent an entire lack of female nominees in the Best Director category at the Golden Globes this year. It is clear from this report alone that statistics don't really do a lot in determining what will be nominated each year. After all, women only make up about a quarter of the crew in the top 250 grossing films for the last few years, yet have managed to pull off two wins two years in a row at the Oscars and the Golden Globes in the Best Director category. You would think that we could logically look at these numbers and draw a conclusion, but filmmaking is art, and art is subjective. That I love, I absolutely love. Um, that's just the air conditioner. So what even are the criteria for a nomination, and how big of a part does misogyny, or probably more likely unconscious bias, play when it comes to the voting? So I found the incredibly long and boring regulations for the Golden Globes, and here is my TLDR summary. 
To be nominated for a Golden Globe, your film needs to have been released within the past calendar year, screened for a Hollywood Foreign Press Association member, either publicly or privately, submitted via an entry form where the filmmakers fill in which categories they would like the film to be nominated in, and then voted on by active and emeritus members and international voters. Now all of these voters have to agree that they in no way have any of these conflicts of interest. Either personal investments in the film, family members in the film, have taken bribes towards the film, or have been influenced to vote a certain way by anyone else. Overall, the whole thing is very business-like, and in fact the entire voting process is overseed by an accounting firm. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of onus kind of put on the filmmakers to make sure that they do their paperwork right and get themselves put into the mix, but things are still up for debate when it comes to the voting process. Now, regardless to agreeing to the conflict of interest things, voters could still be affected by things like unconscious bias or the familiarity principle. We've seen this before with blind film festival picks. The gender split often ends up being closer to 50-50 when the people picking the films don't know the gender of the crew. Also, as humans, we are kind of drawn to the familiar. The mere exposure effect or familiarity principle was developed by social psychologist scholar Robert Zayonkt and is summarised by Wikipedia as a psychological phenomenon where people develop a preference for things merely because they are familiar with them. In my opinion, having director nominations like Spielberg or Baz Luhrmann is kind of key evidence that the familiarity principle may have been in play with the voting this year. And don't forget who won. Steven Spielberg. The Oscars, however, hit my personal gripe on the head in their regulations for winners and nominees. The Academy requires that voting members of the Academy make their choices based solely on the artistic and technical merits of the eligible films and achievements. <laughs> my least favourite word in the entire world. Merit. As mentioned already, films, like other art forms, are subjective. They are not like maths, for example. You can get a maths question wrong, and the criteria in an exam for what makes a person good or bad at maths is very black and white. What's 9 plus 10? 21. You cannot apply that same logic to a film criteria. It is all subjective. And while sometimes we can reach a general consensus about which films are good and which films are bad, there will still be those that disagree, and that's okay. That's kind of the point of art and storytelling, is to make people think, uh, ask questions, start conversations. But over the years, the film industry has been so thoroughly shaped by what a particular gender, and let's be honest, race, thinks is good. And subsequently, award shows are shaped by those opinions too. why I think award shows have struggled over the past few years, because the world has culturally started to shift away from that point of view. What we deem interesting and culturally relevant is now being shaped by voices that come from many different backgrounds. What merit is, is different than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so this dissonance is now being reflected in our award shows. Now, the film industry was thoroughly shaken up by the Me Too movement, and in the best way possible, it shined a light on a culture that was incredibly problematic and highly damaging to women in the industry. A lot of steps have been taken towards making the industry a safer space for women, but there is still a lot of progress that can be made. Now, award shows since Me Too did see a slight uptick in female nominees, and at the ceremonies, people made sure to include something about sexism in their speeches. It's a new day in Hollywood, with new challenges ahead for all of us. And here are the all-male nominees. So I'm hyperventilating a little bit. If I fall over, pick me up, because I've got some things to say. Yet I did write a blog post last year about how all of this is very performative. The big moments that the world is looking at Hollywood, they like to put on a big show and pretend that things are better than they actually are. Now after looking at all of this, I have another question. How much weight should we be giving award shows anyway? They clearly aren't an unbiased representation of the best in filmmaking and storytelling. They play into the cultural climates of the time, trying not to step on anyone's toes and end up doing that over and over again anyway. Plus, the ceremonies have even come a bit of a joke. I mean, the memes last far longer than anyone remembers who won that year anyway. <laughs> I 
And the reviews. Oh, shocking. I saw one that said, this is the worst thing to happen to cats since dogs. So in that speculative article I mentioned at the start of the video that talks about what might be nominated for Best Picture this year, author David Crow makes a great point about the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. He states, the film suggests a future for artfully rewarding cinema that appeals to younger millennial and Gen Z moviegoers, an audience the Academy is eager to court to ensure future relevancy. And I could not agree more. Winning films tend to be one or a combination of the following. Long, boring, depressing, trying to make a statement about something, or quite often just disconnected from the general movie-going audiences. And it's this disconnection that, to me at least, highlights the complete irrelevance of award shows entirely. I mean, who are the Golden Globes even for? If it's for Hollywood, then why are they broadcast to the public? And more poignantly, because they're broadcast to the public, why do they stray away from representing the diversity of the world in their nominations? So take award shows with a grain of salt, and if, like me, you love watching movies, I encourage you to go out there and broaden your horizons. Seek unique stories that you wouldn't normally find, and if you like something, tell people about it, all over the internet or in person. Just make noise and really support those creators that you love. I promise you this will be a far more powerful way to shape the future of the industry than award show nominations ever could be. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really appreciate it. If you did enjoy it, give it a thumbs up, let me know that you liked it. And if you're after more film content, I have an entire blog full of it. We have film reviews, filmmaking tips and tricks and advice, plus a whole bunch of featured posts for female creators that you may not have heard of yet. So head on over to thewomensdirection.com and check it out. And don't forget to subscribe because I have a big plans for 2023. Lots more juicy content coming your way, so subscribe, hit the bell thingies, and you know what to do. All right, see you in the next video. Bye. It's good, I got a little uh, bum groove on the chair to tell me where to sit back every time I come back. <laughs> it's not going well. Your film needs to have been s released. <laughs> Pure panic. <clears throat> Back to my bum groove. All right, I'm definitely gonna say this wrong. Google, tell me how to pronounce his name. Pronounce names dot com. The science. The science. Zayant. Why does that sound so sexual? Do we have the correct pronunciation? Okay, great.